OK, now we I introduce our final speaker for today, and that's Professor Yunan O'Halpin. Uh, Yunan O'Halpin is Professor of Contemporary Irish History at Trinity College. His work centers on political history, military history and security studies, and he is very widely published in all of those. Most recently, he is the author of the book Kevin Barry, an Irish rebel in life and death, which was published by Merriam Press. And only within the last number of weeks, uh, it's Dr. Dahi O'Kerroin, uh, the book The Dead of the Irish Revolution, which is a Yale University Press publication. And both of these works reflect Professor Halpin's own family links with the revolutionary era, which are quite extraordinary. Um, his great grandfather, PJ Maloney TD, was a member of First Doyle. His Maloney grandfather and granduncles were in the Third Tipperary Brigade of the IRA. And the aforementioned Kevin Barry was also a grand uncle of Unions. And his other grandfather, a man called Hugh Halpenny, was a senior IRA officer in County Tyrone. And he moved south into enforced exile in the Free State in 1922. And Professor Halpin is going to speak on the dead of the Irish Revolution, Longford in a comparative context. And I just remind people, please, to uh, mute your mics and keep your cameras off, please, during the presentation. Thank you. So, uh, Professor Halpin, you have the, the floor. Yeah, thanks very much, Martin. I, I may have misled you. My 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 halfpenny grandfather w was from County Down, but uh, so apologies if I if I somehow put Tyrone in. Oh, I'm sorry, prone to I, error. I, I, I may have misread. Sorry, now my apologies. That's fine. And the second the second thing I just want to say is I, I do have a PowerPoint somewhere, but my experience with uh, when you get when you get to my age, these things get very complicated. So. Um, I, I'm going to make some remarks first, and then we can fumble around and see if uh, if we can get the get, if I can actually figure out how to share the PowerPoint. And really, I want to start first of all by thanking uh, Longford uh, County Council, the County Library, and particularly Martin for putting this this seminar together in such difficult circumstances. Uh, I've taken part in a number of of, of these uh, exercises in the last year or so, and uh, and also in 2016. And there, you know, history lies at the local level to a huge extent, whereas someone like me who's tried to do a national study, well, an all island study and even beyond Ireland in terms of a handful of deaths arising from the Irish Revolution, we, we often don't have a clue really about the local and the particular and so on. And it's a point I'll come back to. Secondly, just before we, be, we get to the serious business, as somebody mentioned the Longford not being very distinguished in, in, in Gaelic sports. Well, I, I had the privilege of being taught by somebody uh, who learned his Gaelic football in, in St. Mel's uh, College in Longford. Unfortunately, he, he won two All-Irelands indeed as a footballer, but unfortunately he was from Cavan. John Wilson, a fantastic teacher, so he didn't, uh, so Longford didn't benefit uh, from the, uh, the star whom they produced. And I, I'm very uh, struck by, uh, the, the, in the three previous papers, the, 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 there's a wider population that we sometimes focus on when we think of the War of Independence and we think of politics. For example, in, in, in Paul's paper just now, in Mel's earlier, and in Marie's, there is, there's a wider community or communities uh, uh, within counties that we, that we have to pay attention to. Because even in a county like Longford, which by my, by my measures, is a relatively violent county. It has 27 deaths, which mightn't seem like that much. Uh, that's to say people who actually die in the county. But it's um, that play makes it in terms of population, and we're all used now to looking at death as measured by, in my case, by 10,000 per 10,000 of population, it makes it, I think, the eighth most violent county of, of the 32. Uh, uh, it's just uh, its neighbor, Roscommon, is seventh. Uh, I'll, I'll show you those figures later. But the um, but that's still not a very big number at all. It doesn't, and it's surprising what it doesn't include. It includes one British soldier, that's true, but he's he's a suicide, so he's not killed by uh, by by the rebels uh, by the independence movement. He he shoots himself. It includes just eight, eight civilians, of whom five are killed by the IRA as spies. So that's quite a a big proportion uh, in, in a small number uh, to say to say that that of, of all the civilian deaths. Uh, uh, five are are spies, um, and it uh, raises awkward questions, as the killing of spies generally uh, does uh, in the narrative of the War of Independence. 
Before I go into that, can I just mention, uh, Martin's done a great job here, and just from my knowledge of, of county libraries and county archives, can I say he probably done it in very difficult circumstances, because historically, uh, 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 county library services, I think, are terrific uh, in many ways, but the archival end of it, that, that's to say the, the, the acquisition and collation and making available uh, of, of historical records, be they of, of political of political events, be they of cultural events, be they of ordinary ordinary lives, it, it, it's very far behind what happens in terms of resourcing, especially what happens in, in most advanced states. Uh, and uh, the archivists, the county archivists whom we have are a small and dedicated group, but they certainly don't get remotely the, the support from their administration. I'm sure Longford is an exception uh, that they should do. And the, and the, the consequence of that is that a lot of county libraries and museums and so on have very little, for example, to do with the Irish Revolution. I was in, down in Carlow in the, in the county library there two years ago, in a sense, out of curiosity to see what they had relating to Kevin Barry and the War of Independence generally. And basically, they had nothing. They had the minutes of, of the Tullow uh, uh, workhouse, which were interesting. Uh, they had one or two scraps of things from the early 20th century, but that was it. I was in Westmeath again two years ago in that fantastic, uh, beautiful, uh, uh, where they built in a new, uh, built into the back, back of the old prison, the, the terrific library and uh, uh, the, the, they have an archive service there, but they're very little material. And that's 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 because uh, I think, you know, I, I would hope that administrations will put more effort into, 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 into their archival services, but also that people, and I mean by people, I mean you, you listening, that you go and you take material, which many of you have, and most of it is, is, is in, in, even in Carlo, my relatives in Carlo have material still in Kevin Barry's, in the family home, but it's not properly stored. It's not, it's it's going to degrade further. It's going to fall apart unless somebody does something with it and puts it in professional hands and so on. I, I, I Kevin Barry's last letter to a, a girlfriend of his, uh, a relative allowed me to take a picture of it, which is in my book. And it, it, it's folded up in an envelope in, inside a book, uh, you know, in, in, uh, on a bookshelf in a house. And this, the, the, these things are going to get, get lost. They, you know, somebody doesn't know what they put. It's really important, I think, that we become much more aware uh, of, of our heritage generally, but also that the, uh, we look to our public institutions to look after our heritage because we can't live forever uh, uh, and and that uh, and that they have the resources to do, to do so. Anyway, that's the end of that part of the sermon. Secondly, I, I, just to take on the, the general point from Marie's and other papers, we, in thinking of the Irish, the War of Independence, we have to look at, at the wider population and the impact of them, of what happened where and to whom, and my measure, which is fatality, is a very final and brutal measure. It's, but it's also very, in some ways, it, it doesn't tell remotely the whole story. You couldn't say, uh, for example, your neighboring county of Cavan, which is which has uh, just 11 deaths that I have found over four years, between 1917 and 1921, right? It's the second least violent place by measure by deaths in the, in the, whole, of, in the whole of Ireland. Uh, the first, the, the most, the least violent place, I was astonished, that's to say deaths when put against population, is County Tyrone. But Cavan is, you know, is not awash with blood, I'll put it that way. But yet, life in Cavan, particularly in 1920 and 21, and running on, as I don't do, into 22, was not ordinary, was not normal, was not, uh, was not peaceable. And uh, equally in Longford uh, and in other smaller counties, in Carlow, which I've mentioned, where Kevin Barry's family are from, uh, the, 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 relative, the absolute number of people who die is very small, but the experience of, of in particular from, I would say, from, from uh, mid, the mid and midnight, mid, the middle of 1920, when, when, when the British government decided to get tough uh, with, that, with, with the Irish, with the general population, to put manners on, on Sinn Féin, as they would use the term for the entire independence movement, uh, by, in a sense, by terrorising uh, the population as a whole. And that kind of terror and that kind of fear and that kind of apprehension uh, is, is as much present in small villages where not a shot was fired as it is uh, in somewhere like at Clonfin, where there's a, a very violent exchange and in that case, very successful IRA operation. So so by, by, I'm not trying to uh, dissuade you from the value of, of studying the dead as I've done, but it is only an incomplete picture. 
Uh, I, I think we, it would be interesting to know in, in terms of Longford and obviously Marie's work, it, Marie, Marie has already answered many of these questions in, in her own work over many years. But to remind ourselves, how, how many Longford men died in the First World War? Now, I, I, unfortunately, I, I, I can't see anybody and I, so I can't, if you're all shouting out the answer, I can't hear it. But I suspect it's a lot higher than the number yeah, of... Uh, sorry to interrupt, it's, it's probably about 300 because that's a project okay. working on at, at the moment, our Longford at War project, and we're, we haven't finalised it, but up, up to about the 300 so far. Okay, and I have three IRA men who die. One, one is dies in an accident. So, so for every IRA volunteer that I've identified who dies in Longford, we 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 can hypothesise that about 100 Longford men die in the First World War. So, so there is whatever. This isn't an argument for saying that one one conflict is more important than the other, uh, but it is an argument for saying we have to remember. Uh, in terms of families, in terms of uh, their experiences, and in terms of their memories and things, that 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 that, that those are there as well. Uh, and again, if we wonder how many in in the general population from 1919, 1920, uh, how many ex-soldiers there are in Longford, it doesn't follow that more ex-soldiers equals a more a more peaceful or a more pro pro crown uh, environment at all. That that that's. Now, the British government used to think that, oh, well, ex-soldiers would be loyal, and that's a nonsense. It, it's an irrelevance. I think we all should also think a little bit about our, our long for people who die outside the county. Certainly there, I can think of three three RIC men, I think, perhaps two, and certainly a DMP man, Patrick Smith, who's, who's assassinated because he's a what's called a G-man, but he's, he's a political detective who's killed in 1919. And they, too, have relatives, and they, too, have you know connections and so on. So, so uh, we, I think we take a, a broad picture. I think also, and again, what I don't do is we we look at the people who 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 are who, who who suffer wounds in some way or another, or who are damaged in some way or another by the abnormal conditions, or, or perhaps they're, they're shot and wounded. Perhaps they just are traumatized and so on, because they're the. They, there's a wider, wider set of social consequences, if you like, arising from political violence than, than simply death. And I think we see that Marie has mentioned, and I, she, she's done an awful lot of work already in the military service pensions applications. But the, I mean, you know, we can treat some of them to some degree, some of the records in military service pensions, particularly as she says, the activities files, you would need all the salt in Chester, practically, to, to you know, if you're if you're relying on activities files, uh, if you take them to be, uh, nobody would take them as, as very precise and accurate guides. Not only for for Longford, uh, but but if you look at the the stories of individual suffering and and so on and deprivation and uh, the, those very powerful wider stories than than simply death, uh, I, I I would say. And that applies also to people who, who, as I say, who 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 aren't necessarily uh, in the movement, but people who may be against the movement, and in particular, people who are who are killed as spies, are people who are threatened and, and had to leave because of of the, of the taint of uh, the, the threat that if they stayed, uh, they might die. Um, some years ago, I, I did a couple of television programs about about uh, the phenomenon of people who were quote disappeared. Uh, uh, during the War of Independence, and in fact, it was a problem that ran into 1922. Most the the majority of the of, of these kind of deaths ar arise in, uh, in in County Cork. But I received I, I was uh, uh, somebody got in touch with me, a grandson of, of the Charters family, and uh, it's interesting that here here, here <coughs> here's here's the grandson of, of somebody who's murdered as a spy, Willie Willie Charters, and he 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 wrote to me his family story. Uh, of the of that of that uh, terrible killing uh, and charters as Marie mentioned it was a case where charters had if you like engaged with the uh, with the revolutionary system through through the Sinn Féin courts and so on and it looks to me as though this may in fact although I don't have the local knowledge may in fact partly have been a land issue as much as anything else but I'll just read you what uh, I, I, from from my book if you don't mind I read you about a little bit about Willie William Charters, who's killed on the 22nd of January 1921. He's 27. He's a farmer's son, a member of the Church of Ireland. Uh, a brother had died on the Titanic. Another had died in the Great War. And he's dragged out, and um, in fact, there's a typo. 
a typing error in, in, in my text, which I apologize to the charter family for. But anyway, he's dragged it, dragged out, and to quote, to, this is a relative writing to me from, from abroad in, in 1913. The family afterwards, quote, found a note that had been, had been pushed onto the front door. The note said simply, try curry grain or curry gran. Uh, and it goes on, sure enough, Willie's body was found, shot and dumped in Lake Corrigan, head first. And uh, he goes on to say, uh, these events uh, struck fear into the hearts of my grandparents who fled overnight in the boat to England together with seven young children and two elderly great uncles. They never returned to County Longford, eventually settling in County Down. So there's a very powerful memory. We may dispute it, but there may be other versions, there may be and so on. Uh, but there's a very powerful memory coming not from somebody who's a, a relative of, you know, of, of Sean McKeown or whatever, but somebody who's a relative of, 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 a, of a family who's the death of who, 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 whose family member is noted. But uh, we tend not to know, not to realize, perhaps, that they, too, have memories. Do you follow me? Uh, that they, 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 that that stories get passed on. Uh, not only of, of heroism in the War of Independence or whatever, but perhaps get passed on of, of people who suffered, not, not only at the hands of Crown forces, but at the hands of the IRA. Uh, I should say my, 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 my family um, uh, would be very, very much involved uh, uh, in, in, in the War of Independence, my, my grandfathers, uh, my great uncles and so on. I had a great uncle killed in tip and the stories around his death are, are interesting because he gets killed by Black and Tans, Captain Paddy Maloney, in, in, in a gunfight. The Tans know he's there. I actually have a report saying that he's uh, actually on information received. They go and they surround the farmhouse. But a, a man is killed about seven weeks later in the same farm. And there's three different versions have reached me of why this farm labourer is killed. One, one asserts he's killed because he, the police knew he had been that he had escaped when they killed Maloney and, and, and Duffy, another man. Uh, one, is, one is that he was killed uh, because he, he might figure out where the tip off had re how the tip off had, had reached the police. And the third is that he was killed by the IRA. We don't know who killed him uh, because they said he was an informer. And that's the example at local level, a very tangled, tangled uh, explanations. And very often at local level, you'll find just as in, in British records, which are, of course aren't gospel either, uh, you'll, you'll, find, you'll find a version, but you'll find other versions elsewhere. And they, as I say, the, I'm not saying that, that that the locals always know that there uh, that there's a single accurate story, but I do think the the more the more we explore uh, um, uh, in as rounded a way as possible uh, uh, what what we think happened to individuals and wh why and how the stories of, the, of of their experiences and perhaps their deaths are passed on within families and communities. The more we do this, the better. Uh, okay. Sorry, Chair. Um, uh, uh, I think also, and Marie touched on this too, is, is we, we, we need to start looking, perhaps she again, she has done it at county level, uh, at, at, at prosaic consequences of, of the War of Independence in particular. There has been in, in recent decades quite a lot of scholarship on the burning of big houses, which is linked to the argument about the Anglo-Irish and the treatment of Protestant community. But I'm, I'm very, I would like somebody to start systematically looking at the burning of small houses, of houses that are bare, you know, of, of near you know, labourers' cottages by the side of the road or in remote areas where there happened to be an ambush and the British uh, police or military simply blow the place up. You know, I think there, there's an imbalance again. It's, it relates to the need to look at the, the 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 overall experience of the entire community or communities, rather than focusing on on any one any one of them, uh, any one part of those communities, like activists or like uh, policemen, uh, are by are focusing on um, a single measure, like 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 death, as I, as I have done. Um, it's a very important to study local politics. That's why uh, both, both Paul and Mel, what, what they're doing is really important because the, the thing is, there is not the, the, the idea of national unity and of, of a, an overwhelming uh, uh, political wave. It's more complicated uh, than that, not only in terms of ideology, but also in terms of very often of personalities and, and of uh, previous voting patterns and sometimes of, 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 of families uh, competing for local leadership. But we have to be mindful of it.
I mentioned already, I think a, a, a dimension of looking looking even with, within the just through the narrow prism of counting counting deaths, if you like, uh, we have to be mindful, as I said earlier, of people who die outside uh, the county from which they're from. Sean Connolly has already been mentioned, I think, in this connection, who was from Longford, who dies uh, in the Selton Hill disaster uh, in, in County Leitrim. Um, but there's there's other Bernard Mullahan, I think, was the name of another policeman. A policeman who dies, he gets killed. I can't remember where now. But actually, it's in, in the Drum Keen ambush in, in Limerick, and so on. So, and again, these people, a lot of these people have had families, connections, descendants, and so on. And they they, they deserve to be considered just as much as as uh, say uh, the family of Volunteer X or Lieutenant Y uh, who died fighting for Ireland. There's also a danger. There's a very odd, odd killing in in Longford, which some of you will know much more about than me, where a policeman is shot in in a tailor's shop or whatever by a young man, and the police in the end decide it's, it's an accidental shooting. The young man a afterwards applies for a military service pension, which he may have got on the basis that this was a sort of a planned ass assassination made to look like an accidental shooting. But again, local law is important there. But local law can be doesn't always tell you that, you know, there's different local stories. I made the point already about Tipperary. But local law also brings sort of interesting sort of cultural dimensions to it, if you like. I'll give you one more story from Tipperary, from a place called Bansha, which features in the song, The, the Peeler and the Goat. Uh, but there was an attack on a police, on three policemen coming out of a church in Bansha in, in late May 1921, in which my grandfather, Jim Maloney, and Ernie O'Malley, and Dan Breen, all sorts of people uh, were involved. Um, and one policeman, young policeman, an ex-soldier named John Nutley from Galway, is killed. Another policeman is, is, is wounded. And I was in Bancha, of course, it seems like yesterday, 10 years ago, just having a look at the church where it happened and so on. I was talking to a man. I would have said he said a young man since he was younger than me. So therefore, he was then in his, I guess, his late 40s. I, I just explained briefly there was an ambush here and blah and blah. He said, oh, God, pity you didn't meet my mother. She was always talking about that. And I said, oh, yeah. And he said, do you see that shop, that, that house down the street? He meant shop. It was actually a pub on a corner. I said, yeah. He said, well, I, my mother says that after that police plan was shot, uh, it, it came out that a warning had been sent to the people in that pub to pass on to the police. Don't go to mass. There'll be trouble. And the people in the pub were too scared and didn't pass all the warning. And so when the policeman is killed, his, his mother apparently places a curse on the house that, that the couple who owned it would never have children, uh, that there'd never be a child born in that house. And he said, you know, to this day, nobody who's ever owned that premises, has, has been married or not, has ever had a child. Now, whether that's true or not isn't the point, but it shows you the, if you like, the richness and the strangeness uh, of 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 local memory and local context and so on, uh, which which I thought was thought was very very interesting and somewhat uh, unsettling. Other other points that strike me in relation to the conduct of the war, of the conflict uh, in in Longford in in particular. Uh, the, 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 I think the Clon Fine ambush is obviously interesting from a tactical point of view, uh, as Marie was saying again. It's also interesting though in, in that. Uh, uh, McKeown, as did many, many, but not all uh, successful IRA commanders after engagement, he treats he treats the wounded well, and that's that doesn't uh, doesn't always happen. It didn't happen, as we know, notoriously uh, or controversially at Kilmichael for whatever reason, and uh, on the twenty eighth of November, nineteen twenty, uh, it didn't happen. It happened. It didn't automatically happen uh, elsewhere. It did happen. Uh, Sean Moylan. In, uh, from Cork, although he was actually operating in North Kerry uh, in an ambush, uh, famously, uh, according to the prosecution at his court martial where he was facing a death sentence, but the prosecution put it on the record <coughs> that it, Moylan's men wanted to finish finish off the wounded and well, finish off the captured. I'm not sure if they were wounded or not uh, after a successful ambush. And Moylan uh, apparently said, if you shoot them, I'll shoot you. So uh, it's interesting that some some office did, did, did not. I don't think it varies. It's a matter of where, but uh, some some uh, commanders took a different approach uh, to to the enemy in terms of the same for the surrendered enemy. Uh, there's plenty of examples of uh, crown forces uh, uh, shooting 
individuals whom they, whom they had captured or whom they had or who, who who had who were probably attempting to surrender and there's there's a certain number also of, of where the IRA did the same now in Longford it seemed that there, there, there's I think only one person one civilian who's quote shot for failing to halt which in in terms of the British analysis of of, of how deaths occur uh, the British military analysis uh, a total of What's the figure of 199 civilians? Well, no, sorry, there are also 199 people, of whom 124 are civilians, are cu killed by Crown forces for quote uh, for failing to halt when ordered to do so, or for or for attempting to escape. That's a huge number. That's 200 out of a total of 919 civilians that I that I can find in, in the entire period are killed by Crown forces. I, the man killed in Longford is one of about a dozen people who probably dies because he's deaf. People who are hard of hearing uh, don't don't necessarily hear hear a challenge. And if you've a nervous, probably typically a young soldier, perhaps 17, 18, no brains at all, probably. And he's been told to give one warning or two warnings, then you fire. And uh, uh, so the, 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 the Longford man killed uh, while attempting to escape is is uh, an example of that. Uh, of the Crown forces, I think, don't kill any uh, 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 other civilians that way in Longford. There's one, only one woman killed in Longford, which, in terms of numbers, kind of fits with the with the national thing. Overall, between 1970 and 1921, there's just under 100 female fatalities, including including little kid, little girls. Uh, one of them was shot uh, by a, a accidentally by by a British officer, not not. About, about a mile from where I'm speaking on the South Circular Road. Uh, women weren't, females weren't targets for fatal violence. They were targets for all sorts of uh, other kinds of violence, as, as I might, may get to, uh, but they certainly weren't. Uh, and the, That's the case also in Longford. I think the, the woman concerned, Mrs. Grehan, I think it's Gra Graham or Grehan, I, I have a note of it, obviously, uh, is, ki is killed by a, a shot that may, may not have been aimed at her. And it's not clear clear uh, whether it's just Crown Force or whether it's the IRA because there there was some kind of exchange of fire. So so women aren't aren't uh, targets for fatal violence. And Marie mentioned earlier and uh, the the problem of as it were women spies or lady spies as they are some, sometimes called. And undoubtedly the, there was a, there was a reluctance uh, uh, on the part of the IRA uh, to kill to kill uh, women spies. There was one case, Kate Carroll and Monaghan. Uh, which is quite well known. Um, uh, that's the nearest, I think, to Longford, but the other two were, and there may, I think there's probably three or four rather than two more uh, were in County Cork. So, so it is interesting that whatever the sufferings of Irish women and so on, and their treatment uh, in peace as well as in war, uh, they, at the time it was just not seen as appropriate that they should be uh, subject uh, uh, actually to, to death. They were subject to other appalling uh, um, uh, treatment like again, as Maria said, having their their hair bobbed and so on. My own grandmother, my my my, my granny from County Down, and Annie Hapney or Annie Rice, she told me in kind of jocular terms. She was only she was born in 1905, so she was only 15, 16 at the height of the troubles and the War of Independence in County Down. But she did tell me once when I asked her, what was it like? Did they ever raid the house? Because her brother Dan Rice was a fairly senior figure, and she said. Oh yeah, it was terrible. You'd come in and they'd break the place up, and there'd be flour everywhere. And they'd break the plates, and you'd have to tidy up. She said it almost jokingly. She told me a story about it. Some of you may know the song. There's a song about this terrible girl called Dora, which is it was the acronym for the Defence of the Realm Act, under which the Crown forces operated, and how she would come in like a whirlwind and she'd break everything up. So she told me a kind of a good humoured account account of her experiences of, of her house being repeatedly searched, and not only by the, the police. <clears throat> but by by special constabulary who are local lads who know her, you know, and uh, but then just three years ago, her youngest daughter, she had 13 kids, she widowed at 38, but her youngest daughter came back from Canada, my Aunt Mary, and she told me that her mother's account of, of the house being searched repeatedly and of encounters with security forces were, were was much darker and in some ways much more credible because it was all about your 15, 16 year old young girl in her nighty or whatever. And these fellas, you know, poking her, pushing her around, you know, that sort of sexual element, the sexual menace, not that they, they, 
which she was. But there, there was this was not a story of an assault as such, but but imagine the, the just the fear and, and having to face the guys, fellas who, you know, were, were, the people who, who 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 worked in the fields nearby or who you'd see in the town, and they'd say, "Oh, I've seen you in your shift," and all this kind of thing. And that's a dimension again, which which uh, of 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 uh, of of the War of Independence, the experience, experience of ordinary people, which really de de death, of course, my measure doesn't capture. OK, um, I'm just running through the diff diff different po different points uh, I, I want to make. Um, I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about the day of the Irish Revolution uh, 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 as much as I can uh, generally, but this requires me to get my PowerPoint working. So. Everybody should cross their fingers if they're still awake. And we will. Aha. How are we doing? Yes, we can see that, June, and that's fine. Thank you. OK. Right. So uh, if I can get this working. Uh, I mentioned my, my book, uh, Kevin Barry, which came out in mid-October, I mentioned again now not only to, to persuade you to, to buy it, but because it, it what's, what interests me about writing that book were, were a couple of things. The first, first it relates also to, to, to uh, an issue that, ar that arises in, in Longford in relation to the killing of, killing of William Charters and William Elliot. They're killed as spies, but they're Protestants. And the, the IRA version in Sean McKeown is, issues a, you know, a, a sort of grandiloquent statement saying the Protestant community need not be worried. These these young men are not shot because they're big Protestants. But from the point of view of the community who receive these, who are the, who are at the business end of this kind of action, how are they to know? Oh, well, that, are they supposed to think, oh, well, that's OK? Uh, <clears throat> they weren't, they didn't shoot Willie uh, or the other Willie because they're Protestants and uh, but they only shot them because they think they're informers or whatever. Uh, and even in, in the case of Kevin Barry, I, I, it was only when I was writing the book that I realised that when, when one of Kevin was a relatively active volunteer despite his despite his youth. Uh, by the time he was captured, and one of the operations he was involved in in Carlo at the uh, the first of September, 1920, was the, what was called the General Raid for Arms where across the country at uh, the IRA, IRA units raided houses where they thought there might be weapons uh, to be seized. And one of the houses that they raid, raid, raid in Carlo, it belongs to the local Church of Ireland rector. And the rector has a gun and they know he has a gun because he fires, them, fires on them, that this bunch of armed men who come up knocking on his door trying to get in and they fire back. Now, the, this, this, from the IRA point of view, is not a sectarian attack and it's not an attack on a clergyman. Of course not. But from the point of view of, of the clergyman who sees our men coming from, uh, or from the point of view of his flock, what did they think? And by the grace of God, uh, uh, it would, uh, uh, nobody was hurt. And then the, the, rec the, the police then took the rector's gun. So the IRA didn't have an incentive uh, to raid for it again. But it, but it uh, you know, the different communities may, may could construe what happens to them in, in very different terms for obvious reasons. The other, the other work, obviously, I've mentioned, the Dead of the Irish Revolution, which was published uh, just two, two weeks ago or so, but three weeks ago to coincide with the lockdown. But uh, it, it's uh, it's it's a large work of about um, six hundred and something pages. Uh, the way it works is, is it provides an individual narrative for each death that we've identified. So as well as an overall analysis by county and by uh, by cause and by uh, and so on, uh, you, you get an account of each death. That's why I read, read out part of the account of Willie, Char Willie Charter's death. And Willie Charter's death is an example uh, of where, in a sense, by chance, not through archival work, uh, but just because a relative got in touch with me, that you get quite a powerful narrative. Uh, which is to some extent contradicting probably the uh, uh, the sort of uh, the McKeown line on these things are not so much contradicting but qualifying because McKeown may well have not not had a uh, the IRA in Longford may well have had not had a sectarian bone in their body but when you go killing killing people of, of another faith uh, as I say they may think that that's why you know their families may think that's why they're being killed in their communities. Okay, the main findings of the dead. Here we go. 
In 19, 1916, you, you've just over 500 deaths that we've identified and itemized. And it's so far as we can, we break, we can tell people if people's age, if we can find it out, their occupation, their religion, their marital status, the number of children and so on. And the stories of their deaths. Now, it's very difficult uh, it, it, in Dublin in 1916, and it's very difficult in Belfast, which is incredibly violent in 1920 and 1921, to find out very much about most deaths. And this is one of the difficulties we have. We find out much more about the warriors who die, that's to say those who die in action, particularly on, on, the, on the separatist side, the rebel side, than we do about most civilians who die. Because most civilians who die in Dublin, and there are a lot, including about 20 percent of them are women. They, 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 they are they're the kind of inner city poor by and large. And so they don't have a, a, it's a Joe Duffy did an amazing study with huge resort, research resources, I have to say, of, of the children of 1916. Although he took the age of children up qu quite late, I thought. But the thing is that it, it is really difficult in lots of cases to find out much about uh, some unfortunate who gets killed, uh, you know, walking along the Liffey or coming out of mass or whatever. Uh, but and and it's very difficult, very often, to know what happened to their families and so on, what what happened to their descendants and so on, because they aren't part of the revolutionary elite. They aren't in line for military service pensions later on and so on. So so the civilians kind of disappear, which is which is uh, very very unfortunate. In 1917 and 21, we've identified, <coughs> excuse me, 2,346 fatalities, including 919 civilians, 491 Irish military. That's almost all what we would call IRA. Uh, there, there's uh, one or two Hibernian rifles, I think, uh, our citizen army probably, uh, and some FINA. And there's two common among uh, women, which are, who, who, who uh, is it one or two? Certainly there's one who came in at a late stage. There's 500, 523 police of all kinds. And they're very overwhelmingly, they're, they're RIC auxiliaries and black and tans. There's a couple of Belfast Harbour policemen. There's a, there's a number of Dublin, Dublin Metropolitan policemen, including one who gets shot on holidays down in County Cork. Uh, so, and uh, there's 413 British military. The weird thing about the British military is that 44% of those deaths as I, I can itemize, but it's almost hard to explain, uh, are, are what we call own goals or accidental deaths. In other words, they're not caused uh, by, by the separatists. Uh, some of them, are, there's, there's some suicides, but not so many, but there's an enormous number of, uh, of accidental shootings. The Br British Army in Ireland, to quote Sir Henry Wilson, a Longford man, of course, uh, who was then chief of the Imperial General Staff, he writes in his diary in early 1920, the army in Ireland is composed of, quote, raw, untrained children. Right? This is not a battle-hardened -hard army. These aren't old salts. These are fat kids who may not really be 18 when they join. Uh, one of the people, one of the soldiers killed by Kevin Barry are, and his comrades in that shambles of, of an operation on, in September 1920 in Dublin, for which Kevin is executed, was 15. Not, not, not 19. He, he enlisted saying he was 18. He was 19. He was, but he was almost 16 when he died. His brother had, had uh, his brothers had been in the Great War. One of them had been killed. So the, this is the, the anyway. The point about a young soldier of 18 or 19 with a rifle and ammunition is most. They have to have their weapons on them all the time when they're on duty. Whereas most IRA, most IRA men even very active IRA, and almost all the time they aren't near a gun because they can't carry them in public and so on. But the, the accidental shootings anyway are a huge and chronic problem. Seven, seven soldiers get shot uh, for failing to halt. They're soldiers who get shot for failing to halt. So there's, anyway, the, the, the point about the British military is unlike the IRA, they have loads of weapons uh, uh, and, and they are turn out to be very careless in using them, not only on other people, but on themselves. Female fatality is just under 100, it's about 4%. And most, most, the biggest single place for, 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 for female fatalities uh, after 1916, which is obviously Dublin, is, is Antrim. And Antrim is, is the county, but in practice, it's the city of Belfast. And women die there and girls die there overwhelmingly because of the nature of the conflict, which is essentially uh, an inter largely an intercommunal conflict where people will fire at crowd, you know, they'll be 
it, whether it's a riot, whether it's sniping, they're going to shoot into the other the other area, whether it's the Catholic area or the Protestant area. So uh, you do get significant numbers of, of female casualties there. <clears throat> In one case, two two young women are chatting, two young Protestant women, as it happens, when when a shot is fired and passes the head through the head of one woman into the head of another, and they both die. Uh, uh, I can think of another case where a young girl named Le a young woman named Letty Bray, who has certain disabilities, she's deaf and has a bad leg, but she's out after curfew, and she she tries to run away when a military lorry comes along and they fire in the darkness. They may have thought she was a, a young man, but she's killed, and so on and so on. But women are not, by and large, even in intercommunal conflict, they're not targets. The way in other intercommunal conflicts in, in, in Europe at the time, women were considered, females were considered legitimate targets. By and large, in Ireland, they aren't, for whatever reason. I, I've touched on that, yeah. <coughs> so who does the killing? Well, uh, the Irish military, we think, are responsible for just over a thousand deaths. Uh, the police, the Crown forces for a little, little more than that, civilians, because civilians have guns and things, 72, and, and, and we've had 176 where we're not sure uh, who's who's responsible. In fact, the Lady Grahan in, in uh, the Longford, the only woman killed in Longford, in that case, you can't be sure. Uh, reading the accounts in, in the press or reading the inquest, you can't be sure who fired the shot that killed her, because it was probably, as far as our memories, it's a ricochet. OK, well, well I, I've touched on Longford already, but I'll just say it again. We have 27 recorded fatalities in Longford. I must say it's very curious. I hope you'll forgive me not not having any eye contact. It, it's uh, very disconcerting for me at the end of my career. Uh, I'm used to blank faces, but not to a blank screen. Anyway, uh, you have six, 16 Crown Forces deaths, three Irish military and eight civilians, including five spies, two of as I've touched on, were Protestant. The RA don't kill a single soldier in Longford. That's interesting. Uh, it, uh, you do have a, a military suicide, but that uh, that that may reflect the reality in much of Ireland that the, the military were not, in a sense, in the front line. Even in Dublin, uh, when you, Kevin Barry, the operation he's involved in September 1920, in which three, three soldiers are, in a sense, unintentionally killed. The aim hadn't been to kill them. The aim had been to, to surround the lorry they were on and then produce revolvers. That had worked very well in County Leitrim. Charlie McGoohan, an ex-soldier, led a group of IRA volunteers coming out of a church where they surrounded a, a British lorry. They didn't even have guns and disarmed six soldiers and, and got their weapons because the soldiers aren't on alert. They're just kind of dozing. Uh, but um, in Dublin itself, the IRA didn't kill a single British soldier uh, up to the 20th of September 1920. So, so the military are, have a different relationship with the public generally. I think throughout the War of Independence, uh, than do uh, than do, do in particular the Black and Tans, than do the regular police who become the target of the IRA, and so on. And the interesting measure, but measured by I said it earlier, but it's very significant. Measured by population, Longford is the eighth most violent county in Ireland in terms of the deaths, and the second most violent in Leinster after after Dublin. And can I say that Carlow, to my amazement when I when we did these figures, uh, Carlow, which is a small county, which is a total of 13 deaths, uh, is in fact the fifth most violent of, of the 12 Leinster counties. So this is a war, a very a war of independence, a very uneven uh, in terms of fatalities, very uneven consequences uh, from one county to another. And sometimes it's almost, it's hard to explain that you, if you take your neighbouring county of Roscommon, where there's something like 62 killings, uh, fatalities, there's in, in Galway, on the other side of Roscommon, there's 65. But the population of Galway is twice what the population of Roscommon is. So what's Roscommon got that Galway doesn't have in terms of, if you like, of, of revolutionary fervour or whatever? It's it's a, and it the, the the it becomes more interesting because you would think well there's a history of land war or agrarian trouble and so on but it, it doesn't follow the one of the quietest counties in Ireland Queens County County Leash where I think there's eleven deaths right including about three spies in the last week or whatever which is kind of catch up the same happens in Offaly where there's a few more deaths but they kill a lot of spies so relatively at the end almost as though they need to have a sort of a notch on the gun. Uh, but but uh, Queen's County have been very violent in, uh, during the land war of the 1880s. 
So, so I don't know why it is that people like Mel, uh, his work uh, probably have a better answer than I do, or Paul for that matter. But they're not here. Now this this is a diagram from uh, a chart from from uh, uh, from the book. Uh, uh, just just showing showing yeah fatalities per 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 ten thousand of population. You see, if you if you put uh, nineteen sixteen in Dublin, Dublin has by far the most. But if you take nineteen sixteen out of the equation, you go seventeen to twenty one. Uh, you'll see there uh, that Cork Cork uh, with by our count five hundred fifty seven fatalities, and and measures against population is by far the most violent. County in term in terms of deaths, but uh, Longford is 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 pretty high up. Uh, uh, if you think that 27, 27 fatalities uh, gets you eighth in this kind of grim league table, and places I mean I what staggers me I would have thought Cavan or Wicklow would have been or Fermanagh would have been the least because the absolute numbers are so small. But in fact it's Tyrone, which is uh, curious given what we know. Uh, more contemporary uh, uh, Irish republicanism and so on, and political violence. Just to, just to then finally, can I make an appeal to you all? You shouldn't be listening to me. I think you probably realise that yourselves by now. What you should be doing is is looking in your own attics or looking in your neighbours' attics, your granny's attics. Uh, on the right, you'll see here, I, I, I think you can see, or you can't yet, you can see now, uh, a, a, a 1911 uh, automatic pistol, I think it's a Mauser, uh, that belonged to a man called Thomas Brennan, who was an IRA officer in, in, in County Monaghan. His son, Pat Brennan, married my, my father's sister, Nula. Uh, they settled in, in, in Coot Hill in County Cavan. And that, that gun and an associated document, I'll show you, along with a big cache of documents, were in a biscuit tin in Pat Brennan's chicken shed in Coot Hill for years and years and years. And he had them in a biscuit tin because when his father was dying, his father, who never spoke about the War of Independence, would tell him, told him all about, about General Lake in 1798 and all that, but would never talk about the War of Independence. Um, who became a fee to fall councillor and was involved very much in the military service pensions and things. But when he was dying, he, he sent for Pat and he said, Pat, there's a, a tin box there and I want you to look after it. And so Pat had it for 40 years in his shed until uh, <clears throat> eventually in 2006, he, 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 he had told me about it actually at my sister's funeral and uh, we, we, uh, we got together and I, and, and I looked through it. And amongst the, the material he had was this gun. And the gun is probably linked to this. And this is an example of, of why we shouldn't keep we, we should take material and put it in an archive or a library or a county museum where it can be used. And this collection, the pa Thomas Brennan papers, is now in the Monaghan County Library uh, where people can actually access it. But the, the point here is, is, is that gun is probably linked to this killing because what, what Pat Brennan did in the 1930s, Tom Brennan, so he wrote an account of what his battalion did from 1917 to 1921. He probably wrote it uh, in order to compile what Marie mentioned earlier, an activities report uh, for the Military Service Pensions Board so that they would have, a, have a, an account of the of his battalion against the claims that people made saying, I did this, I did this, I was in that ambush. But it, in the, this sheet of paper is particularly poignant because it, 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 I don't know if you can read it, but I, I'll read it to you. Uh, it's what, what it's about is the discovery of an apparent informer who's writing letters to the police in 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 Monaghan saying where where uh, where the IRA are hiding stuff, and it goes on. The case was investigated, and the Bat IO, that's Battalion Intelligence Officer T B, that's the uh, the man writing this T B Thomas Brennan, but he writes in the third person, which is significant. Uh, found that the letter was written by Kate Carroll. Case reported to Brigade OC, who sent two men to warn her to stop this at once. Our serious notice would, would have to be taken of it. He goes on. She denied all knowledge, but proof was forthcoming next day when another describing the men who had given the warning, and he just writes, etc. And then when you turn the page, he's on to another story uh, relating to the IRA in North Monaghan. But the point is what they did with Kate Carroll who was a neighbour, she was a, 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 described as a simple-minded woman who was a putching maker, and the IRA uh, kind of cracked down on putching makers periodically, as did the police. Uh, 
They came, they came for her at night. They dragged her out of her, out of the, the cottage in front of her mother and her disabled brother. And they took her up the mountain and they shot her. And that has hung over that part of Monaghan and the narrative of the independence, independence movement in Monaghan, not in Longford ever since. But the point about it is this, this indirect account of, of, of how that happened was, was lying in a chicken shed. Uh, till my uncle, my late uncle Pat Brennan of Crute Hill, once of Scotstown, uh, uh, mentioned it to me, and then uh, eventually he put it in, in in a museum, and it's much better off the county museum in Monaghan uh, than it would be in in a chicken shed, a derelict chicken chicken shed at the back of a house uh, in Crute Hill. So that's it, Chairman. I think I've uh, probably outstayed my welcome, so I'll stop.